Joe, are you still there? All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. We're always excited when we get to make these connections to remote places on the planet, and we're doing this for another Hearts in the Ice event today. So we're really excited to have uh, Cinnabas Orby and Hilda Strom joining us uh, from Svalbard. They've been there for well over 100 days, living in a remote trapper's cabin called Bumsabu. In total, they're going to spend nine months there, becoming the first women uh, ever to ever overwinter uh, in Svalbard on their own. So along the way, we've been, they've been taking part in all kinds of amazing citizen science projects. And each month, we've been able to connect with them for live events and have different experts from around the world uh, join in live with us. So Hilda and Sunova, we have you by the magic of satellite connection. How are things going in Svalbard? Yeah, hi, Joe and Allison and everybody. Things are going uh, very well. It just seems every time we talk to you, Joe, that we're in a massive storm and a whiteout. So why? I mean, why should today be any different? Um, no drone flying today. Winds are too strong. No ice core sampling. Uh, zero visibility outside. Um, so no cloud observation. Uh, and Allison, no uh, salt water collecting for us today, and no aurora observation. Um, so what we've been doing instead is writing restock restocking supplies like wood and ice because um, there's um, we need that. And then we've been planning for what happens after May. Um, Joe, you're spot on. We are um, going to be here for nine months total. Today, it marks 162 days. Uh, Hi, everyone. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are really excited because this month is February, and February for us means that we kick out all the men and spend the entire month highlighting only incredible women from around the globe. Over 45 sessions featuring people from over 20 countries, highlighting every science you can imagine. Today's session is a little bit special too, and I'll find out why in just a minute. But first, I want to introduce our two classes. We might get one more joining in a minute. But right now, we've got Miss Tully Herons, grade one, twos in Brantford in Ontario. Hi, guys. Keep the note, keep the note, keep it going. <laughs> and Miss Waver joining us, representing the Laurel Springs School from all over the world. Hi, Miss Waver. Hello. Hey. <laughs> from many, many countries, we're excited for lots of great questions from your kids. Now, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speakers. So we are joined live at the Royal BC Museum in beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, by the team there. And they're going to walk us through, showcase a bunch of amazing scientists that are on staff. I don't want to steal their thunder, so I'll turn it over to them to explain a little bit about what they're doing and who is being featured today. I am very excited. All right, so let's turn it over to them. Go for it, guys. Hello, my name is Jenny. I work here at the Royal BC Museum. Um, and to get started, we have some slides to show you just so you know exactly where we are. Um, so we are all the way up in Canada. Um, so Canada is the North Country. Um, and I've actually lived in Canada my entire life and actually on Vancouver Island my entire life. Um, we're just going to show a slide so you have a little bit better idea of exactly where that is. So this is the Royal BC Museum and Archives. Um, the next slide is going to show where um, Canada is. We're all in the big, big white north. And Victoria is all the way down at the bottom left. And that is in British Columbia. So we are the Royal BC Museum of all of British Columbia. And we're located all the way down um, in Victoria at the very bottom of the island. Um, and we are also, um, if you can go to the next slide, and we are gathered here on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people. We just wanna recognize that, um, that we are here on this land. And now we're gonna get started in talking with Victoria. So today we have a very exciting program when we're gonna be talking with three different um, people who work here, three amazing women who work in science here. Um, and we're going to start with Victoria Arbears, and now we just um, saw that the polar bear had killed the reindeer. So maybe that's the way they go on. And, uh, yeah. Sorry, 
All right, so we may have just lost our satellite signal. I'm gonna give it a moment and see if they're able to come back uh, in and join us. I'm gonna stop my screen share for just a second. Um, if we don't see them in about a minute, I'm gonna change gears and we are gonna introduce Allison. Uh, and Allison will talk a little bit about her work and the really cool citizen science projects that she works on. Uh, but in the meantime, I do want to give a shout out to our classrooms who are starting to tune in live on YouTube. Don't forget, you can still get in on the action. Uh, use the chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from. Send us in some questions and we'll make sure that we work those in. And then once we have Hilda and Sunava back in with us, they have a couple more pictures that I want uh, them to talk about. They've been doing projects looking at the Aurora Borealis. They've been taking ice core samples. They've been using tools to lower into the water and measure uh, the levels of phytoplankton. And in fact, I think they're back here with us. Yes, uh, we are. We are back. Perfect. So I'm popping right back into that screen share and we are on the slide. So there's a slide with the two gentlemen, looks like quite an old picture, uh, observing the Aurora the way that you're doing now. And then I've jumped to the picture of the two of you uh, taking those Aurora measurements. Well, yes, then that I have to say, um, it, it, we don't get any sleep here when the when the lights are happening because we are outside. They're moving all the time. Uh, all the gases in the atmosphere, and they're red and they're green and they're purple. And um, the other night, and Hilda's, uh, I've never seen her so excited. Uh, we had the like the corona above us, and so we were photographing from below and above. It has been an absolutely incredible experience to be here this far north um, with nothing between us and the lights. It's absolutely fascinating. And uh, that picture, those pictures are just the early Aurora pioneers and then us polar pioneers because we were actually, they're calling us uh, rocket citizen scientists. We photographed a rocket launch that NASA did uh, to, try to study the Aurora and see if um, there's a whole other climate change aspect to or, or, or uh, weather aspect to how we measure the changes that are happening in our world. And one of them is to look at the changes in, with, the, with the lights. Um, and it's a long topic. I can't get into it right now. And I don't know that much about it, actually. But um, all this to say that we're adding some valuable data through our observations and photos, lots of time-lapse photography around the lights. Super, super engaging and fun. All right. Very cool. So I just showed a picture as well of the two of you silhouetted with the skidoo looking at the auroras. And now I've moved on to a slide. Uh, the two of you and, and the dog, you're hanging out. You've got a big, huge tool, looks like an ice core. What are you up to in that picture? Yeah, we are taking ice core samples for Eunice. And uh, the ice is very important for all the life uh, in the sea. And uh, underneath the ice, there are some small uh, animals. Um, and, and how they live and how they breed and how um, smaller fish eat them. So all this life underneath the sea, sea ice is really important. So we have, we, we take 46 centimeters or the sea ice out here, outside here now is 46 centimeters thick. So we drill a hole and then we cut the lower layers of the ice and, and take them inside, melt them and um, so the, the scientists will get these samples when we get back, and they will find out what kind of uh, animals uh, are living underneath there just now and how much of them. So that's also very fun to do. All right. We're seeing you in what looks to be a little bit of warmer time, sitting in the boat. You've got a really cool-looking little tool on a line, and I think you're taking some phytoplankton measurements. We are, and that is where Allison, our rock star, Allison, um, is uh, plays into the picture. We're collecting phytoplankton from a net, and we're also dropping a disc into the water, a fetchy disc. And we were doing that uh, religiously every week uh, until the ice came in, and now we're completely frozen in, so no boat in the water, um, just drilling holes in there and collecting saltwater samples that way. But 
Um, super interesting. And Allison will talk more about that. But, you know, it's really lit a fire under both him and myself in terms of the importance of a tiny little microorganism that most of us have never even seen. Um, and how important that is to understanding the value of this dynamic um, food chain that exists underneath uh, in our ocean. All right, and the final picture I think is a really good example of how resourceful the two of you have to be and ready for anything. So you're doing a little motorboat repair, a little engine repair. We are. Um, anybody who needs anything MacGyvered, call us because we, oh my gosh. I mean, we have no, you know, we have no store to go to and get a part if we're missing it. We have nobody to really help us with things. Um, we do use a satellite phone to get some, some help with uh, different things, but it's, it's the two of us figuring it out, problem solving. And I can tell you, it builds a tremendous amount of confidence in us as women to be able to be in these conditions, have all these problems that we've had and face them like head on and embrace them. And there's no, you know, there's no alternative, but to find a way um, to fix it. And, you know, knock on wood, because there's some of that around here. Um, we've been, we've been doing really, really well so far. All right. Excellent. Well, I think now is a perfect time. I'm going to come back from that screen share. And I think it's a perfect time to introduce Allison. So, uh, Hilden Sunova, if you want to stick around, awesome. Otherwise, um, you can pop in and say 10 minutes. And in fact, I think their satellite just dropped. So I think that was a good time to introduce Allison. So Allison Cusick is joining us today. She is from Seattle, Washington, and now lives in California, pursuing her PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego. She studies phytoplankton in polar fjords and manages the citizen science project uh, Fjord Phyto engaging travelers in cutting edge research, understanding how melting glaciers influence the first level of life in polar regions. So she first traveled to Antarctica uh, on the Ross Sea in 2013 in an icebreaker that was 53 days long and she's visited the peninsula in Antarctica every season since. So Allison, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're looking forward to getting to know a little bit of your work now. Nice to see the classrooms, teachers and hear Suniva and Hilda in real time. All right, excellent. So I know you have a little presentation to share with us and then hopefully we'll have Hilda and Sunova back in Svalbard and we'll do a little Q&A action between the two groups. Yeah, so let me pull up my share screen. Presentation up. Are you able to see that okay? Oh, I think I muted you on accident. Oh, there we go. You're nice and full screen, perfect. Okay, awesome. So um, I'll just walk you guys through my journey and how I got involved with Antarctica and then how I got involved with Sunny Von Hilda up in the Arctic and how those two systems compare to each other. So thank you for being here today. Um, I want to take it back to when I was younger and had to decide what I was going to do with my life. Um, in high school, I thought being an astronaut would be cool because they travel to some of the most remote regions in the world. And I really liked traveling. This led me to look up what NASA astronauts get their degrees in, and a lot of them um, studied science. So that kind of put me on this trajectory to learn more about science and biology and geology and dig into learning more about our world. And that led me to Antarctica. So this is at the bottom of the world. You can see here um, Australia and the tip of South America. It's a very isolated place, probably the most remote region you could get to. Um, and it was incredible. So this is a little video that's showing kind of what that environment looks like. The ocean surface has frozen over with slush ice. And this is similar to what Hilda and Suniva just said up in the Arctic, um, they are frozen in. So it's very difficult to get a boat through this type of an environment. Um, this is uh, what hooked me uh, feeling like I had landed on another planet. And Antarctica is actually um, the coldest, uh, windiest and driest region in the world. And uh, if you look at the golden color that's forming around these pancake ice, um, this was the research vessel I had gone on for 53 days. This is my first time going to sea. It was quite incredible experience living on a boat for that long and having very limited access to communicating, just like Sil uh, honey, Sil 
Hilda and Sunniva have. So if you were to take all of this brown uh, color that you see here around the ice and look at it with the net, like Sunniva and Hilda are doing, it turns into this really green, uh, goopy pancake. And under the microscope, that's these incredible little organisms that you see uh, to the very far right. Those um, are diatoms that are pictured there. But in general, we call all of these microscopic um, organisms phytoplankton. So phytoplankton just means a plant drifting in the ocean. And they're all single cells. They're all microscopic. And they come in a variety of shapes and sizes that you see here under the uh, microscope images. Um, they're also incredible because they um, come in, these look like little aliens. So they are, some of them are covered in silica, like a glass. Some of them are covered in cellulose, like a wood. Others are covered in chalk, um, uh, calcium. And they do crazy things. It's like a war zone in the ocean. They're trying to survive, trying to avoid being eaten, trying to defend themselves and trying to eat. So there's a pigment that they use to do all of this living. Um, they're taking sunlight as a form of energy. They also, if you wanna say they eat uh, carbon dioxide, they eat your basic chemistry elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, and iron. And when they grow rapidly, um, you, they turn into blooms. So just like wildflowers blooming in a field, uh, phytoplankton bloom in the ocean. And you can see these blooms from space. So on the left is a picture of these blooms. And you kind of see it's a milky blue and green. And those are um, satellites are able to pick that color up. That pigment is called chlorophyll A, which you may have heard about when you learn about terrestrial plants on land. And um, in the ocean, this is kind of what it might look like. So in a normal situation under the ice, the water might look more blue and clear. And then when you have this bloom happening, it's really green. So that's what's being picked up by the satellites. And this is an image that's showing um, you have green, all that chlorophyll. You have the green that you can see from the plants and trees on land. But you can also see that in the ocean, there's all of this green, and that's the phytoplankton. And when you think about what phytoplankton are doing in plants, they're creating oxygen. And that's what animals use. That's what we use to breathe. And they're responsible for over 50% of Earth's oxygen. So it's not just the Amazon rainforest and the plants that are doing all that work. These are like two lungs of the Earth. And this little video is kind of showing in the Northern Hemisphere. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, the Earth is going back and forth between the seasons and the summer. And then again in the winter as the ice grows and the plants die off. So this is pretty mesmerizing. And this is what's making the entire ecosystem of Earth survive. Um, you can also probably see, I don't know, can you see my pointer at all? Maybe not. Yeah, it shows up. Um, so Sunny Von Hilda are up here in Svalbard. So you can kind of see how the sea ice grows and then the phytoplankton will bloom. Of course, this is enhanced coloration, so the whole ocean isn't turning green, but it's just for the um, sake of showing the dynamics over the season. And I want to focus here on the polar regions. So I work down in the south here in Antarctica, and then uh, Sunny Van Hilda are continuing the work and expanding it up into the polar north, into the Arctic. And these two systems, um, we also call these the high latitude or polar regions, they're very different but also similar. So in Arctic, in Antarctica, you have land that's surrounded by ocean. And in the winter, the sea ice grows away from the land. And then in the summer, it melts back and you just have the continent. And this keeps it very isolated because you have the big ocean, Southern Ocean swirling around. Whereas in the Arctic, you have an ocean that's surrounded by land. So it's completely opposite. And you get your sea ice growing in the winter in the middle of the ocean. And then in the summer, that sea ice retreats. But it's got all the land input and it's in total contrast to the southern polar region. So if we look at the food webs um, in the Antarctic, you have very short transfer of energy. So all of these big animals, like the whales, the seals, the penguins, the seabirds, they're relying on this one dominant uh, little animal called a krill. And that krill eats the phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton rely on these ice dynamics, the sea ice and the glaciers and the cold waters. So if we 
similarly go to the Arctic here, where it's an ocean now surrounded, or an ocean that's surrounded by land, your food web in the Arctic looks a little different. It's still similar, where it's a short transfer of energy through all these to these big animals. So you have the polar bears now, and you have land predators that are going for the animals that live in the ocean eating the seals, which then eat the um, cod and herring. And those are eating, instead of krill, where you get in the Antarctic, the major crustacean is called a copepod. And they have, there's these little crustaceans that have really long antenna, um, and they're eating the phytoplankton in the water called diatoms, but also there's algae that grows under the sea ice. And then of course, in the Arctic food web, you also have a human influence and humans that survive on these marine food webs. So this is kind of what gets the whole system together and uh, a close up of showing some of those crustaceans and little larvae. You have a little larval crab, little larval fish also eat phytoplankton. You can see in the stomachs here, a slight green color. That's all that phytoplankton that's feeding this small layer of the food web. And just like we have different produce available, different times of the year, we can't get, I mean, we can nowadays with the way we ship food around the world, but if you were to just live locally, you have seasons. So just like we have seasons for harvesting our produce, in the ocean, you have seasons of different types of phytoplankton available for those other animals to start eating. So we have things that happen in the spring when the sunlight comes back, in the summer when the bloom of phytoplankton is occurring, and then all the animals start to come in to feed on that. And then autumn, things start to die off. And then in winter, it gets really dark and we don't know much about what's happening. So this is where Sunny Von Hilda come into the picture. And I um, am so excited that they were able to uh, go up to Bumzabu in Svalbard for nine months of the year. That's quite incredible. And you heard that it's very difficult to take samples, especially when there's storms, when they get frozen in. Um, this is the same for uh, research scientists as well, to put a ship in the ice in the middle of the winter or to even live out in a hut and take samples is very difficult work. So when Sunny Von Hilda said they were interested in doing citizen science projects, I was incredibly excited because these projects are ways that scientists can uh, work with non-scientists to just get more information about the world we live in. So just as showing on the globe, just to remind us up in the Arctic how far north they are, they're even further north than Greenland, even further north than Iceland, almost at the North Pole. So they're right where that sea ice starts to form in the winter time. And this is showing Svalbard and just this fjord that the Bumzabu hut is on. They're here on the south end of Svalbard. And uh, I also wanted to show a picture of the glaciers because it's not only about sea ice forming, it's also about the glaciers on land. And you can see the snow is starting to fall be behind Seneva and Hilda here. And the glaciers freeze up in the winter but then also in the summer, when the sun starts to come back, those glaciers will start to melt and bring fresh water into uh, the marine environment. So there's, there's many dynamics going on to understand here. And when you put different sources of fresh water into the marine environment, you can see here if we have glaciers melting or sea ice forming, that might change the chemistry and the physical properties of the ocean. And so the, what I'm interested in looking at is that first layer of life. How is that first layer of life in the phytoplankton affected by this change in the environment? And then maybe we can translate what we're learning from that to all these other big animals that rely on these small animals or small plants, plant life. Um, so I gave Sunny Von Hilda some tools that we use as oceanographers. Um, they have a net and a secchi disc. They have a bunch of bottles that they can take samples with and then also uh, ways to preserve samples so that later when they're done with their nine months, I can start analyzing those. And you saw the picture of Hilda here holding the secchi disc. This is a quick way to see if there's a bloom happening. Uh, secchi discs might be difficult to use now that they're frozen in and the ocean is frozen solid. So the samples they're taking uh, with the ice cores and looking at will allow us to look at what kind of algae is underneath the sea ice. Um, and then as that starts to melt, they can uh, use the secchi disc once again to get some uh, measurements. 
And I just wanted to show you what it looks like on a research vessel. So we use these giant instruments and a research vessel, maybe a scientist can get time on a ship for one month out of every year. Um, and it's very difficult to get time on a ship in the winter. You may have heard about the project Mosaic. That's a project going on right now with the research vessel that's been locked in ice and it will be tracking what happens in the Arctic Ocean for a year, September to September, which will be amazing to compare also with what Sunny and Hilda are doing. And for the citizen science approach, um, this is nine months. They're, Sunny and Hilda are there taking samples every week um, when they can. Uh, of course, also depending on weather conditions, this is a video just taken down in Antarctica showing a similar um, method that they'd be using when they do have open water and can tow a phytoplankton net behind their boat. And that just provides more data, more information about the system. It's uh, cost effective and can reach more people when you engage, um, you know, not only classrooms and telling you guys about it, but also people who are able to be in these areas where they can take samples. Um, some quick data. This is the only graph I'm going to show you guys in the peninsula in Antarctica. Uh, these are results we found. So over time, it's the complete opposite of the Arctic. So your summer down in Antarctica runs November through March. And we can, the samples that are collected um, from people that are traveling down to Antarctica show us how many phytoplankton there are and when the numbers increase. You see these spikes here in December. That's a bloom happening. We can also look at individuals. What types of phytoplankton are actually there? Are, do we see the small ones, the big ones, the ones covered in glass, the ones covered in chalk? What are we looking at? So Sunniva and Hilda, because they're up in the Arctic, they're able to kind of make the similar time series. So it will be very interesting for us to be able to compare uh, what they're finding up there with what we're seeing also down in the Antarctic. And well, I, just want to, I just want to pause you for one second. We can keep the slide up. Yeah. But I do just want to work in a question from Ms. Matson's class because I know that their period is going to end shortly. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Ms. Matson's class, some high schoolers are hanging out in Green uh, River, Wyoming. Let me get their microphone turned on. I want to make sure you guys get a question or two in before your uh, period ends. How are we doing, Green River? Hello. So, give me, so give me one of them. Say it. Well, what do you have, Taylor? What's your question? How do the plankton survive the freezing cold waters? Can we get that uh, one more time, bud? How do the plankton survive the freezing cold waters? Oh, perfect. Did you get that, Allison? Yeah, so the plankton can survive the freezing cold waters. Each plankton has a different tolerance for temperature but the ones that live in the Arctic and the Antarctic are specially adapted to survive that environment. So they have um, the ability to, within their cell to uh, avoid being frozen. So they have specialized in these extreme environments and um, they're able to do that. But if you take them out and warm them up, they'll die. So they're very sensitive. All right, very cool. Well, Green River, thanks so much for joining us today. And Allison, if you want to uh, continue, we're ready. Yeah, um, I'm almost finished, but I just wanted to point out that I've been talking about how uh, phytoplankton use sunlight to grow, but Sunny Von Hilda have been in the polar night. So there is no sunlight that allows these big blooms to grow. This is showing up in the Arctic, um, how you have six months of night, the polar night, um, depending on where you are in the Arctic. And um, so the question is, what's happening then with the phytoplankton if there's no sunlight? There's some ambient light from the moon or from the aurora and the stars, but this hasn't been shown in research to be a huge influence on um, providing enough light for the phytoplankton, which are also stuck underneath the ice. So the ice is hiding the phytoplankton from the light. But as I have been explaining, um, getting measurements up in the Arctic or in these remote polar regions in the winter has been very difficult for scientists. So there are actually not very many publications um, compared to other fields in the literature of what's going on in the winter. So if anybody's interested, when you get older of becoming a polar scientist, uh, doing some studies during the winter months, if you're a brave, adventurous soul who likes to be in the dark. <laughs> um, this might hopefully inspire you. Um, we thought that um, this seasonality that's happening 
that nothing's going on in the winter. So scientists had found that there's not much activity. Uh, maybe the phytoplankton go into like a hibernation phase. Maybe they fall to the seafloor and just wait it out until the spring and the summer winds mix that water back up to the surface where they can get sunlight. Um, but the idea is that because we don't know and this whole ecosystem's relying on what we know from the summer, the winter can also play a really big role in setting up the system so that it's ready for that light to return, ready for the phytoplankton to start growing again so that you can have a very rich and active summertime. So there's a lot of work to be done for winter studies in the polar regions. And uh, yep, so that's the end of um, that. But I wanted to let you guys know how you guys can get involved in other citizen science projects. There's a web page called SciStarter. There's over 3,000 currently active projects around the world. So you can search for citizen science projects near you or ones that you could participate in online if you're not able to get out into the field. And I'm really excited to see what Suniva and Hilda have been able to collect and to start analyzing those samples when uh, their season ends. And uh, with that, I wanna thank you guys for listening and thank you to Suniva and Hilda for collecting samples. And uh, this is just showing uh, myself and the other graduate student, Martina from Argentina. She uh, lives down in Buenos Aires. She's also analyzing these samples. And then our advisor, Maria Verne, who has been studying phytoplankton for over 30 years. So thank you guys. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can as well. All right. Very cool, Allison. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your research and some of those citizen science options for classrooms to take part. Uh, that's how I started. It looks like an awesome website. So I hope the class, uh, the students spend a little time there. Uh, let me check in and see. Uh, Hilda and Sunava, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. All right, perfect. Well, we are going to start meeting some of our classrooms. Uh, classrooms online, don't forget, you can send us in some questions. Uh, and I'll give a quick shout out. I can see a few groups here, Salisbury Elementary in Pennsylvania, uh, Randolph Elementary in Arlington, Virginia. So send us in a couple of questions, uh, anybody who's tuning in. And classrooms, as we visit you, uh, you can ask uh, two different kinds of questions. You can ask Allison some questions about phytoplankton and uh, working in the Arctic. And of course, you can ask Hilda and Sunova about some of their citizen science, as well as what it's like to be living in a trapper's cabin in Svalbard for nine months. So let's get that going. Uh, let's start off. Let's take a little visit to Mrs. Logan's group. Looks like some seventh graders hanging out with us in Freehold, New Jersey. Let me turn that mic on. How are we doing, Freehold? Great. Wonderful. All right. Hey, everyone. Who's up with a question? Why did, you, why did you choose this career? Okay, so Allison, I think that might be one directed your way. Why did you choose your career? Um, I, I think it was kind of a long series of different decisions. One is uh, because that explorer uh, part of me really loved being in this remote region, in the polar regions in Antarctica, especially um, just feeling like that was like being an astronaut going to the moon. Um, I don't particularly like cold regions. Um, I'm a warm weather person, but I also think uh, scientifically, it's such a cool environment to study. It's an extreme environment. Um, so being able to study phytoplankton where I can look at genetics and how they've evolved as different organisms and how that relates to these global processes that they're contributing to with carbon moving around into the globe and with oxygen production and then also being the source of food for all of life on earth. I think all of those different aspects really interest me, keep me interested in being a polar scientist. All right, and maybe we'll flip a version of that question uh, Hilda and Sunova's way and ask in a little different way, why did the two of you decide to spend nine months overwintering in Svalbard? What drew you to the Arctic? Can you still hear me, Joe? Yeah, we still have you. Okay, great. Um, why did we choose to spend nine months up here in Bumsabu? Um, the short answer is the two of us have had over 20 years each of experience in the polar regions. Uh, lucky for us. 
Um, we've spent our, you know, our lives, our livelihoods out there in, you know, in the mountains, on the water, uh, on the ice. And we have explored and we've seen just so many changes over the years. And we've gotten to spend time with smart people like Allison and other researchers where we've learned. We're really curious people. We've learned so much about what's happening and why and how important it is to actually be curious and understand some of the changes that were happening in our world. And we wanted to, to be really blunt about it. We wanted to do something. We wanted to use our experience, um, our experiences together and be here and contribute to the conversation and and engage people through these phone calls and the data we're collecting and inspire people because there's a whole lot of gloom out there around climate despair and it's kind of depressing to hear, you know, how much our natural world is changing and how much the ice is shrinking. And we wanted to, you know, quite simply um, create a platform, um, which is Hearts in the Ice, to inspire and engage people in a passionate way um, instead of in a kind of a depressing way. So it it just became a very natural evolution for the two of us to to be here in this little trapper's cabin for so long and long underwear. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Let's take a little trip to Stratford, Ontario. We have some students hanging out with Mrs. Lenny. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Stratford? All right, who's got a question? Oh, can you lean closer to the computer? We didn't catch that. This one's for Hilda and... Um, uh, Sunova? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does your dog help out in the um, Arctic when you... Okay, so uh, Hilda and Sunova, that question was directed in your direction. They're wondering, how does, how does your dog help you out in the Arctic? Our, our dog, Etra, she is helping us in many ways. She, uh, at first, she didn't uh, bark when we had our first polar bear visit. But... Um, she had a very close encounter with a polar bear, and I think she got a little scared. I would have uh, if, if it was me. So then she started to bark. So now she tells us when we have a polar bear around. So that's one way she helps us. And she's just the cutest dog you can think of. So being here just to Nevada and me and having Estra, it's it's fantastic. We we run with her, we walk with her, we play with her. Um, and she loves to be together with us. She Last night she was outside. It was minus 27 degrees. She has a big, thick fur, but she also could very much love to be inside with us, and we have her a lot inside. Um, so she helps us in any way, many ways. All right, awesome. So we're going to take Great. a look. We're going to jump to New Jersey this time. We've got some... Students hanging out uh, with Mrs. Thom. Let me get their microphone turned on. Where is it? There we go. Oh, and I think I might need you to turn your microphone on for me. It's not cooperating. There we go. How are we doing, New Jersey? Good. Okay, who's up? <laughs> okay, go ahead, Leo. Nice and loud. Is it hard to adjust to living in the Arctic? All right, so Hilda and Sunova, they're wondering how hard was it? Was it hard to adjust to living in the Arctic? Uh, I think Sunova might have to answer that one. Um, I was born in Norway and I grew up in Canada. I live in Squamish, British Columbia, or at least I did before I came here. And Hilda has been up here for 25 years. So... um, Hmm. I have to kind of pause to think about how to answer that because this is a very different life from anything I've experienced. I think the hardest part has been adjusting to the fact that we had uh, three plus months of black polar night dark. And I mean, 
I mean, dark and it plays with your head and your, your sense of well being. I felt like there was this cloud hanging over me, very sleepy all the time, even though I take vitamin D. Um, but we have found, I mean, we both read a lot about the early polar explorers and how they survived any extreme circumstance and we learn from them. Um, so we both have a really strong routine here of staying active. Uh, we communicate a lot. We write, uh, we have coaches that help us with, in, you know, just, just communicating all sorts of things. So um, the adjustment is just taking one, you know, small step at a time and not trying to, trying to eat the whole project all at once. Take one day at a time. All right. Excellent. Allison, let's sh throw that question your way, but change it slightly to uh, what was it like adjusting to life on board a ship for a month or more at a time? Yeah, living on, on a ship is a totally uh, different experience too because you're isolated just on that ship. So you have the same people you're interacting with. It was the same 25 scientists I was seeing. Um, even now on the uh, ships I go down to the peninsula with, um, they're tour ships, but your life becomes very simple. You, um, your tasks are very um, straightforward as far as what you have to do that day because you're not constantly checking email or taking care of well, I don't take care of my pets on a ship. Um, I wear the same outfit every day. So you have extreme cold weather gear, so you stay warm. But I, there's also a chef on board that cooks for you. Sometimes on the research vessels, the, the food is not very good. So you get used to eating canned peas, carrots, rice, and uh, frozen meat um, to, to get through when the fresh vegetables um, stop being fresh. Um, so yeah, you're just totally focused in that world. And so sometimes I feel like coming back to civilization, I get culture shock because it's like my life had been so straightforward <laughs> on the ship. But, and then of course, if you get seasick, you have to deal with seasickness and I get seasick. So you just take medication for that. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to take a quick little visit. We've got a group. Uh, Miss Cousins is joining us. Uh, from Montreal. So I believe this is the school that uh, Cinema is an alumni of. And I just thought I'd see if anybody has any questions over there. I just want to congratulate you for your, was it 190 days so far? Uh, we're talking about uh, your mental well being. We wondered if you have a specific uh, thing that you do to keep your spirits up. Uh, what do you do to? change up your atmosphere when it needs changing? Um, great question. And hi, Sharon. And hello, everybody from TRAF. Um, love that you guys call in. I, a short answer for that is, um, you know, we both have little rituals and routines. Um, light is very important to us. So I find candles to be a great um, mood buster if you're not in a good mood. Um, we train a lot. Um, we, you know, physical activity, fresh air. Um, we spend time with Etra. I, I read. Um, writing is an incredible thing uh, for, uh, as an outlet and, and um, a communication tool. So we're both, both of us are working on a book and we both write in our journal. Um, and there are different ways that we bring people into our environment here. I mean, we're completely alone, so we have no outside stimulations. It has to come from both of us. So we're both super careful about how we interact with one another uh, and how we communicate. Um, but our little routines and rituals, self-care is a big one, too. I mean, we haven't had a shower in what feels like forever. Uh, but we do wash our hair out of a bucket and we, um, you know, we, we did take a little sponge bath. So all those little routines and rituals um, of self-care and reading and writing and uh, looking at the incredible art from Trafalgar students that I got too, that's been inspiring. Um, and music. Uh, I don't think I, either one of us could live without some music. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the ways that we keep our men mental well-being alive. Thank you for asking. All right, very cool. Um, so I'm gonna duck online and steal one question from there. We have someone wondering, how long is it gonna take for the ice to recede? Uh, how long until the ice kind of returns to the level it was at when you arrived?
Can you hear me still? We still got gotcha. you. Hello? Okay, Hi. this is a record for us uh, on the phone without being disconnected. It's incredible. Um, so right now, uh, as Hilda mentioned earlier, the ice is frozen in much sooner than it would have normally been in this area, in this fjord. Normally it would be sort of ice-free until maybe, what, March, Hilda? Until about March. So we have been in a very unusual year this year where we had ice really early. So we're expecting this ice to be here. We have a tr uh, ship um, uh, that uh, did, that's coming to pick us up in May, and one of the things that Hila and I have been talking about is what if the ice is still here and the ship cannot get in? We have to bring all our supplies to the other end of the fjord, and that's going to be very challenging. So we're not sure when it will break up. Um, everything is dependent on those um, the weather and the seasonal changes. It could be as early as uh, April. Uh, we're hoping it's as early as May, but it could be a little later. All right. Well, uh, let's try and squeeze in one or two more questions from the classrooms. If we need to visit your class, give me a wave. Uh, if you guys have a follow-up question, we can sneak in maybe one or two more before we sign off for today. So there we go. Let's go to New Jersey. Let me get uh, your microphone on. I see someone waving nice and close to the camera. All right, we got gotcha. you. Was there ever a time that the ship was stuck because of the ice? All right, Allison, have you ever been trapped in the ice? Uh, yeah, that, that happens. Um, so when it's unintentional, so sometimes a ship will intentionally go into the ice, but there uh, was one time where the ice moves quickly and if the tides change or the winds change or the currents change. And we once got stuck for about six hours. Um, it's okay when you mean to get stuck, but when you don't mean to get stuck, um, that's when you just have to have a lot of patience and the captain is actually in charge of um, trying to get out of there. So the research vessel I was on was an icebreaker. So it was able to just go back and forth and back and forth and try to break itself free. And then eventually the winds and currents all shifted. And so it was easier to get out of the sea ice. But yes, that does happen um, and it can take a while. <laughs> all right. And I think I see someone standing in Stratford. Do you guys have another question in Stratford? Yeah. All right, we're ready for you. Do you guys study any animals other than plankton? Phytoplankton. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think Hilda and Sinova, that's a great question to throw your way. Are you looking oh, at any animals phytoplankton? Yes, uh, we are, and the phytoplankton are very hard for us to see, um, but thank God, and Allison, you forgot to mention this, that you gave us a microscope, which we have turned into a great source of uh, pleasure for us, too, looking at all these little microorganisms under the microscope, but we are doing a wildlife observation for um, the Norwegian Polar Institute and UNIS, and so we're recording um, polar bear sightings and also the size of the front uh, paw print and the back paw print, um, and that indicates size. Uh, we're also looking, uh, observing foxes and reindeer. Um, it was heavy mating season here in, I want to say, up until October. Is that right? Um, thank God I have my expert Hilda here on some of these things. And um, we're also uh, birds. Uh, we will um, collect um, hav, hes. They are, um, I'm trying to think of what that is in, in English. Um, so we will open the, uh, when we find dead birds, we will open the stomach lining of them and we will pull out some samples uh, because many of them have died from an ingesting microplastic. So we will also take some plastic from the stomach lining and send that for observation too. So, uh, and we're also using a drone. Um, there, there is some theory out there that drones might be an uninvasive way to study wildlife and also uh, be able to study size of wildlife and dense uh, density of populations like reindeer. Um, so where the drone flies very high, 100 meters up, which is 300 feet. And so we're able to, when we do our drone flights, we're collecting some observation of any wildlife that would be around it would, without disturbing them at all. So, um, yeah, it's been very interesting. We have a log book. Um, we record, you know, GPS location, latitude, longitude, what time, what day, 
how many. Um, it's been really very. It's we're 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 quite busy up here, <laughs> but it's a good busy. All right, and Mrs. Logan's group. I feel like we should give you a chance if you have one more uh, to jump in. What do you do with the ice samples when you're done testing them? What do you do with the samples when you're done testing them? Maybe that would be, well, there's Seniva and Hilda. Are, there's some ice core samples that will go to other researchers, but the seawater samples um, will count under the microscope. And then um, there are ways we can also do genetics uh, to get at who's in the phytoplankton community. And then afterwards, scientists tend to be hoarders. So we don't like to get rid of our samples, even if uh, so we have a little bit left we will but um yeah <laughs> until we know for sure everything's been published and accurate um, we usually keep them all frozen or in a refrigerator for years all right well that big burst of static we just heard was losing uh hilda and Sunova. so the satellite signal just dropped on us um this was a really good call usually we lose them four or five times throughout the call. So only to lose them once or twice is pretty darn cool. But Allison, we're gonna give them maybe 30 seconds to come in and join us and we'll do our big goodbye. But Allison, while we have you, uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and sharing some of the work that you're doing. It looks like you had a great time dropping them off uh, at the cabin. And uh, when do you think you're gonna be out on a ship next? Um, I just spent two and a half months in Antarctica, so I am going to stay put in San Diego for a while. Um, I will be on a ship for one day in April uh, to take some students out here on the coast of California, but no big plans to be on a ship for a long time uh, till next season. Um, but yeah, it was nice to meet you all, and thank you, Joe, for the call, and thank you for your questions, everybody. And I, yeah, keep exploring. All right. So next month, we will connect with Hilda and Sinova from uh, Bumsubu again. Uh, this time, we'll be talking about biodiversity. So we have an amazing guy named Jim, who's been diving all over the world, and he's going to talk to us about biodiversity. We'll learn a little bit about some of the, the marine life and the land life that uh, Hilda and Sinova have been seeing. But I'm hoping in the next like 30 seconds to a minute that they're able to come back in, because it's always nice to end the call with them being able to say goodbye too, not just for them to come back in and find we're gone. So hopefully um, they'll come back in and join us shortly. Quick shout out to the YouTube classrooms. Thank you for joining in and sending us in uh, some questions. And uh, yeah, if you wanna follow along, um, you can check out Hearts in the Ice online if you search it on Google, also at Hearts in the Ice uh, on Twitter. And it looks like uh, Hilda and Sunova, you've jumped in at just the right time. We are just about to sign off. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, so much for being on the call today. All right. Well, it was great to have you. We can't wait to connect next month and talk a little biodiversity. Yeah, me too. Thank you. And um, we it's crazy to think it's February now, the end of February, and in May, um, we go home. It's going to be, uh, like Alice said, a bit of a culture shock. Um, but we really hope, you know, all of the students and teachers that are on the call right now, and thank you so much, Joe, for hosting a platform like this. It's, I think it's so important for everybody to, you know, lean in and, and, and stay curious and find a way to use your passionate self uh, in this great big world we have because we all have a very, very special distinct purpose. All right. Awesome. Well, a huge thank you to the classrooms on YouTube and live on camera. Allison, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And Hilda and Sunova, stay warm. Uh, watch for polar bears. And we can't wait to connect again in May. So thanks, everyone, for hanging out today. Thank you, guys. Last thing. Thank we'll you, do, everyone. We'll turn the microphone on, boys and girls. Nice and loud. All right. and thank you. All the way to Svalbard. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining. We are signing off for today.